morning everyone. Great to be here again in my living room and um, here to praise the Lord. I uh, hope everyone's getting used to all this online stuff and the online meetings and um, who knows how long we're going to be in it. But I guess the consensus seems to be how long is a piece of string? So I'm just adjusting my pulpit, my homemade pulpit. So praise the Lord. Uh, this morning I want to continue on and continue to talk about um, check the oil. And I asked a couple of questions last week and I put them to you. And, and one was, what oil do you have in your lamp? What oil do you have? I don't know if anyone's young enough uh, to remember in 1986, you know, mid to late 80s, there was a Castrol commercial that came on the TV. And the commercial was, oils ain't oil, soul. Oils ain't oils, and of course they were talking about you can't just put any oil in your motor. You can't just put any one in, they were recommending using the Castrol ones. And so uh, we can't just put any oil inside of us. What kind of oil are we putting in? What kind of oil do we have? I don't know if anyone's ever, not just in oil, are looking at if anyone's made the fatal mistake, and I have to admit, I have done this, of putting the wrong fuel in their car. And uh, thankfully, praise the Lord, that I saw it as I was filling up the car and realised, oh, I put uh, unleaded in the diesel. I know other people who I shall make, uh, remain nameless and um, that have done that. And uh, fortunately, I was able to change the seal things to her. No, it wasn't sealed. It wasn't sealed. I, I actually did it and I was able to salvage it. But, you know, obviously you cannot put unleaded in a diesel car. You can't put diesel in an unleaded car. Um, we have to have the right fuel and we have to have the right oil in there as well in a motor. If you have an oil that's got too low viscosity, it doesn't do well by the motor. It can make it run hotter, it can make it run rougher. And so what is the oil that we have? And when we look at Acts chapter 10 and we see what's going on there, we can see the beginning of the Gentiles, that's all of us, having this new oil that's coming into our lives. Uh, that was happening back then. Excuse me, I'll just get my Bible out, ready to go. And so um, when we have that happening there, the other question I had is, uh, what are we fixing our eyes on? Are our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? And, and so we know that we spoke last week, Cornelius had his eyes fixed upon God. Uh, he didn't have the revelation of what was happening. He didn't have the revelation of what and who this God was until Peter came along. But he had his eyes fixed. And I was using the example of a guitar and how when I got something or, you know, when we buy a new car, we notice all these other new cars. But you can also train your eyes to look specifically for something. Um, I have been someone shall remain nameless who is ribbing me about mowing my lawn three times a week. And that is just ridiculous. It's winter. I only mow it twice a week, not three times. But what I have had to do, like most lawns, we get weeds growing through them. But I've trained my eyes to see the weeds as I'm mowing. So I'm constantly out there picking the weeds out of the lawn, picking the weeds out and grabbing them to the point that as I'm mowing the lawn, I can actually see the weed before I hit it with the mower and I can pull the weed out. And, and so uh, that nameless person, it's only twice a week now. It's winter, twice a week. But we train our eyes. So what are we training our eyes to see? Are our eyes focused on what we see in media? Are our eyes focused on what we see on Facebook and YouTube and things? Or is our eyes fixed upon Jesus? And that's what I want to encourage everyone to do. No matter what we see happening in this world, that our eyes will be fixed upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. You know, Matthew, we spoke about Matthew 13. And in Matthew 13, uh, we talked about the hidden treasure. And so when you have find that treasure we would do anything to search for that treasure jesus is my treasure he really is my treasure he's my joy and my delight uh, and so i want to read something first um, i'm going to read it from the passion translation um, i'm going to read 2 corinthians 7 and in 2 corinthians 7 uh, 2 corinthians 4 sorry 7 to 13 Reading from the Passion Translation, I think it does a great translation. We read this. We are like common jars of clay that carry this glorious treasure within, so that 
the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's, not ours. Verse 8, though we experience every kind of pressure, amen, listen to this, we are not crushed. At times we don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. We are persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us, amen. We may be knocked down, but not out. We continually share in the death of Jesus in our own bodies so that the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed throughout humanity. We consider living to mean that we are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. So then death is at work in us, but it releases life in you. We have the same spirit of faith that is described in the scriptures when it says, first I believed, then I spoke in faith. You know, that's that first part, we are like common jars of clay that carry this glorious treasure within us. And, and of course, Corinthians is also talking about um, that we dying to self, that we're, we're stripping away the things of the flesh. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to our lives to strip away the things of the flesh so that the glory of God may be revealed in this mortal body. So that the glory of God may be revealed in me that I may be a light that shines brighter. So if I want the lamp in my life to shine brighter, I'm going to have to make sure that the right oil is inside this lamp. I'm going to have to make sure that the right oil is inside this vessel, that there aren't contaminants in it, that there aren't things that would make it bright, burn dimmer, that it would make it go lesser. So we allow the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to our lives that would shift us and change us. Remember also that by default, doing nothing means we go backwards. We can't just sit by idly and just go, oh, well, this is, I'm just going to stand here where my ground is. By default, we, we, if we don't move forward, we are actually going backwards. And praise the Lord that he is the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, in, in Acts, and we can turn in our Bibles, getting ready to Acts chapter 10. And uh, of course, we dealt with Cornelius last week, a Roman centurion in Caesarea. And, and Peter uh, is the first of the apostles, the first of the apostles to stay in the house of a Gentile and eat with him and all his household. Uh, and the important thing of what we see in the book of Acts and what it's saying here is that the, the story and the narrative that's getting laid out in chapter 10 is so important that it actually deals with it again in chapter 11 and then it also shares a portion again in chapter 15. That something is happening in the world at this time that was so important that God felt the need to put it in three times. Three times in the word, three times that it was mentioned in here, and when you'll see some things that go on. But first, before we get into Acts chapter 10, I would just like to just backtrack a little bit and just sort of talk about Peter. And today we're going to talk about Peter. Next week, I'm going to talk about the third aspect, a third perspective of what we're seeing in this book. And so in the book of Acts and chapter 10. But at the moment, when we look at chapter 1 in Acts, we see Peter who stood up among the disciples and he spoke. And it was Peter that said they should find another to take the place of Judas Iscariot so that it could be. In Acts chapter 2, we see Peter who stood up again and preached a message uh, when people thought that the, all the, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and they thought they were all drunk, it was Peter that stood up in the midst of them all and started proclaiming the word of God and declaring what was happening to the point that as he spoke and he said what the word of God said, the Bible tells us that 3,000 people gave their life to the Lord. 3,000 people gave their life in Acts chapter 2. In Acts 3, we see Peter and John going up to the temple to pray. And Peter, as he's going along there, uttered these famous words, Silver and gold have I none, but such that I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. And we see this amazing miracle take place in Acts chapter 3. In Acts 3, again, he, he, Peter starts to declare, Men of Israel, why are you marveling at this miracle of this man being healed? And he, he makes this point and he said, The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And he makes the point, when he says that, 
every person there knew who he was talking about. It was Jesus was the God of God of Jehovah, the God of the patriarchs. And Peter was saying that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob glorified in his son, Jesus Christ. And he establishes the authority and he establishes this line of what God is doing. In Acts 4, we see Peter and John arrested, uh, but not before 5,000 people get saved. What a meeting that would have been. 5,000 people, you know, the, the atmosphere that would have been there. 5,000 people just going, yes, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to give my life to you. What an incredible time there that we see. In Acts 5, Peter and the apostles, um, they're put in the prison, a general prison. And we see an angel come in, open the door, tell Peter and the others, get out. And he tells them to go to the temple and speak. And uh, just to confound everyone, if the angel closes the door and locks it again, and he does that. In Acts chapter 8, Peter and John, they go to Samaria, and they go there to pray for the people to receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 9, we see Peter who goes to Lydda, northwest, and it's, Lydda is northwest of the Dead Sea. It's a little bit up from the Dead Sea, and it's, it's towards the coast, but not quite on the coast. And he goes there and he prays for Enos. And Aeneas was bedridden for eight years and paralyzed, and Peter prays for him and he gets healed. Uh, he then continues from there and he heads across more to the west coast where he goes to Joppa. And it's here in Joppa where Peter um, meets a disciple called Tabitha or Dorcas. Uh, and Tabitha gets sick and, and she dies. And Peter then prays for Tabitha and, and she's raised from the dead. He prays for Tabitha and she's raised from the dead and Peter decides to stay and continue the work in Joppa. And he says that he stays in Simon the Tanner's house and he stays there. And, and that's where we find ourselves, that Peter's life. So you can see this journey, this miraculous journey where God has brought Peter from the um, point of crucifixion of Christ and into the book of Acts, the journey that he comes along and we find ourselves in Joppa and again. It's on the western coast. It's on the coast of Israel. There's only one coast. It's on the western side there. And uh, he's in Joppa where we find this in Acts chapter 10. And so when we look at Acts chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 9, and we're just going to read and have a look at some of the things that God is point, pointing out for us today. In verse 9 it says, The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. About the sixth hour, then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and he saw heaven open like an object, like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending on him, let down into earth. And one of the things that we see and we notice that's happening to Peter here in verses 9 and 10 is that Peter prayed and he didn't just pray, he listened. How often uh, are we praying to God, but do we take the time to listen to what the Holy Spirit might want to say back to us? Are we listening and are we ready for God? You know, a miracle was about to happen at Joppa. A miracle was about to happen. We'd already seen a miracle happen at um, at Cornelius's place where he was there in Caesarea and he was saw the angel come to him, which we read about last week. And now we're seeing and it says, as the men traveled to Joppa at the same time as they're just about near the city, the Bible tells us that Peter falls into a trance and says that he was hungry and uh, they were preparing the food. And so we see this picture that God is painting and showing us in the word that Peter is hungry and then he shows him a vision. He shows him something of food and he's hungry. And it's interesting to note. So when we want to see God move and when we want to see God share with us and reveal to us, are we hungry for what God has or is it a snack? Are we full already or are we hungry? And Peter shows us that he was hungry for this. The next thing we see that happened with Peter is Peter also positioned himself to receive. He positioned himself on the rooftop. Now, it's not unusual for people to be on a rooftop. I remember when we were in Nepal and uh, we were staying with Pastor Rinzi in his uh, place there and they had a rooftop and on the rooftop is where everything would happen. They would prepare their food there. They would hang out the washing there. Their kids would play up there. And of course, they would pray up there as well. 
Um, the irony was we didn't realise there was so much dust around Kathmandu that it was only on the last night when we were there when um, that no traffic was driving, kind of like what's happening now when we're seeing um, no the pollution just drop down in all these countries around the world and we're you know we're seeing this amazing earth that we have and we saw the same in Kathmandu on the last night we were there on the last day I should say we went up to the top and we could actually see the Himalayan mountains what a sight it was really impressive so on the rooftop amazing things happen on the rooftop and of course they would pray and Peter had positioned himself and he was praying it, it was on a rooftop that King David walked along and he fell into sin it was on a rooftop when Jesus said to his 12 disciples, Accordingly, what you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. It was on and through, I should say, a rooftop that we see the paralytic lowered through the roof and that we see the miracle happen there. You know, of course, I thought I'd add this one in there, that uh, Proverbs 29, 21, 9 tells us, It's better to live... In the corner, it's better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. That's not my case. It's better to live in the corner of a roof than in the house shared with a contentious woman. So we now find Peter on the rooftop and he has a vision of what God's going to do. But he doesn't just tell us that. It tells us something else that's really important too. It says that Peter falls into a trance. Peter falls into a trance and he has, sees a vision. Now the trance talks about the state he is in and the vision talks of what he sees. A, a trance, the word uh, ecstasis or ecstasy, it's the state in which the normal actions of the senses, the normal senses are suspended. And it's not uncommon that we see, the Bible mentions five times in the word of God that we see that story of they fell into a trance we see it with Balaam when Balak, Balak asks him to speak against Israel and it says that he was moved into that place where he could see what was happening we see it also when Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, when he has says uh, he had a vision whether in the body or out of the body and he, Paul also mentions it again about his Damascus Road experience when he has the encounter with Jesus um, and we see that three different times. I, I looked at that and, and you can look at it and say, well, why didn't God just give Peter a vision like he did Cornelius? Why didn't an angel just appear to him? And why didn't the angel just start to say things to him? And, and I, I, wanna, I think we put that in there and God put that in there so that we could see the amazing importance of what was happening. And what was happening here was God suspended his natural senses. You know, when God wants to move in our lives, sometimes he suspends things in us and he puts things apart and he can do that through crisis. He can do that through hardships. He can do that in, in any situation. He can even do that where things are going really well and we just get to focus on one thing where God is desiring and God is aiming for us to see a particular way. And so Peter is in this trance and he sees the vision. Um, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, 10 tells us we continually share in the death of Jesus in our own bodies so that the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. That we have that continual sharing of Jesus that we focus on what is God saying, what is he doing and how does he want to reveal these new things to us. And so Peter has this vision and we continue reading and we see what this vision is that he has. In verse 12, it says, in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and the birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, no, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything, anything common or unclean. And then a voice spoke to him again a second time, what God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken into heaven again. So Peter now faces this point, that Peter faces a crisis of culture that he's coming to. He's been told by God, Peter, kill and eat, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, Lord, no, 
uh, his whole life he'd never done anything like that and he's told to eat something and uh, I'm certainly not getting into the aspect of whether it says that they could eat or they couldn't eat because that's not what I think that's this story is focusing on it's focusing on something that is about to happen and we notice in here it says these two words and there are key in this he says it's I have never eaten anything common or unclean now in the Hebrew culture, and we read this in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, that things were made common and things were unclean. So God was telling the Israelites what they were allowed to eat and what they weren't allowed to eat. Now, the word of God and the law that said to them that if a unclean animal was to touch a clean animal, then the clean animal would become common. And so it would become, and what they would say is that it was... Um, the cleaning of something and if it became common if it became unrighteous they would have to go through this ritual to make it cleansed again to make it that included the people if they touched an unclean person if they touched an unclean thing they then would become unclean and they would have to go through this ritual to make it clean again uh, and it was a cleansing now when something became common or unclean it was called a desecration and so those two things are really important to remember, that the law was showing them what to touch. I'm sure that we've all seen this before and read this in the Bible before about things becoming clean and unclean. And so Peter has this vision where these animals are brought together. And we notice that they're in this sheet. The sheet brings the animals down and it said they were all mixed up. So immediately Peter sees animals that he could eat and he sees things that he can't eat. But straight away he's recognized that the unclean has or the clean I should say has now been touched by the unclean and so it becomes common uh, the Pharisees of course in their ways and their wisdom uh, this also decided that they needed to take it to another step and they did that and it said they made it so that they said even if you if you touched an unclean animal, which you know, it became unclean, but it was also a point of if it became around you and it brought it to this place for the Pharisees that there was a guilt by association. A guilt by association. Uh, I think of, um, they said that if you eat it and touch it, and that reminds me of Genesis in the garden where the serpent came to Eve. And uh, he said, the serpent said to Eve, did God really say you can't eat it? And Eve responds, he just said, the Lord said, if we don't, we can't touch it or eat it. But that, of course, wasn't true. That was a deception there because God didn't say you couldn't touch. He said you couldn't eat. And so the Pharisees brought this same uh, thing back into the culture of the Hebrew culture where they said you couldn't even touch it or you became unclean. Now, if we turn into Matthew chapter 28. Jesus gives them a, a final instruction. In Matthew 28, Jesus gives them the final instruction, and of course it's one that's this great commission. In verses 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus appointed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in the heaven and earth. Go therefore, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. That we know this great commission that was told to the disciples, and it's a commission that we all hold dear in our faith. Go into the, all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples of all men and nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What an amazing declaration, and it's a statement. But when we see this, and what's happening here is it's now 10 years down the road. It's 10 years down the road from where Jesus has given him the example he was died he crucified he rose again and we find 10 years later peter's on this rooftop having a vision 10 years later this crisis that peter was facing this crisis of culture isn't just something light 
that he was in the midst of a culture that he said you were not supposed to associate. We read it later on where Peter says to Cornelius, you know it's unlawful for me to be here. You know that I shouldn't be here, but of course we know the revelation that he's about to move into. But changing culture and shifting culture can be a hard thing to do. Uh, tradition does not die easily. Uh, what traditions do we hold on to when we shouldn't? You know, we're used to a certain oil. We're used to a certain oil being placed within us. What things do we hold on to and we shouldn't? I, I remember that um, when Seal and I were first married and uh, Seal was cooking and she made spaghetti. And she made spaghetti, but she made it the way her mother told her to make it. Well, that wasn't the way my mother told her to make it. I ate spaghetti. My mum made it a certain way. Seal's mum made it a different way. And I remember the first time she did it, I was going, what's this? What's this? This is not how you have spaghetti. This is not how it was a tradition that I was used to and say, this is not how it's supposed to be. Now it's okay. We can eat both ways. It's all good. Well, from me. Some traditions can be hard to change, you know. <laughs> Uh, when traditions and the culture of the Israelites, when we look at Mark chapter 7, in Mark chapter 7, it says in verse 1, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of, disciples, some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. When the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the, to the tradition of elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. But what traditions, what culture, what things do we hold so fast to, even in our church, even in our uh, religion, that we have that, I should say, a religious approach rather than a life approach. That we say, no, this is how it's got to be. And Peter was now at this crisis where he had to deal with something. This isn't something that, that just came by. This was hundreds of years of culture. It was ingrained into their lives. As much as like we look at Australian traditions and, and we had yesterday uh, an amazing Anzac Day. And I hope I, I saw a lot of people going out into their streets. And we went, Seal and I went into our street and uh, we were there and um, we were looking at others. And it was actually quite moving and it was quite amazing to see people come out into the streets. Could you imagine that if we stop that tradition? It's just unthinkable, isn't it? It's just unthinkable that we could stop a tradition of Anzac Day. How, it just, you wouldn't even think of it. You just couldn't do it. So Peter's at the same place. How does he break a tradition? How does he break a culture? How does he do something that's different to what God's telling him to do? You know, what about other things that we have in our Australian culture? Boxing Day tests. Well, could you imagine a Boxing Day test not going ahead? What about Christmas seafood? Well, the things that we normally eat. Uh, what about, I found that you know, an Australian thing to do is that when we catch a, a taxi, an Uber or something, that a lot of times I think it's found that Aussies tend to sit in the front. And I know the rare times that I've caught a taxi, I tend to just get in the front seat, not the back seat. Apparently it's an Aussie thing. What about... Creating a nickname for people. And uh, we don't just say, you know, uh, we don't just say Cecile. We say Seal or Sealy and other names that she doesn't like. <laughs> we have this tradition in our culture that this, we're Aussies. This is how we do it. Peter is finding this place where God is wanting him to see a new truth and a new revelation he brings him to this place. The other thing that we can see here is that um, when God shares with Peter, he always confirms his vision. He always confirms his vision. And so we read that. Now, while Peter stood, wondered within himself what this vision 
he had sent meant, Behold, the men who had sent from Cornelius had made inquiry from Simon's house and stood at the gate in verse 18. And they called and asked whether Simon's surname, whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision and the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And so Peter goes down there. So he understood that God confirms vision. God always confirms things. If God gives you a word, it will be confirmed. And it's confirmed in the word of God. God won't give you a word that's against his character. God will never speak to you that is not, in, in, that is not aligned with his character, that doesn't align with the word of God. Uh, God will never do that. And so Peter had these things. And we said before that he was, it's written down, this story of Cornelius and Peter, three times in the Bible. And threes meant things too. They understood what it meant. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The three sons of Noah with the flood. The three sacred objects in the ark. The golden jar of manna, Aaron's staff, and the stone tablets. Jesus said, of course, he will rise in three days. Peter denied Christ three times. And three times he was affirmed. So they understood something was happening. And it says here that this is done in verse 16. This was done three times. So Peter could see that God was confirming something that was about to take place. That for a shifting in our lives and what we have to do in sharing the gospel, what truth and what oil does God want to place within us? Ten years before, as I said, Peter received this command from Jesus, go into the world, preach the gospel. Ten years later, they're still at this place where they were only able to preach to the Jews. Ten years later, they were only able to preach to the confines of what they had because of this tradition of common and unclean. They didn't want to mix into things that would maybe make them contaminated. Peter decides and he sees that God's spoken. And what I like about Peter is he acts on it straight away. In verse 28 is where we read and he says, You know it's unlawful for the Jewish man to keep company or go into another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter had the truth and revelation that there is only God's culture. In Galatians 3, chapter 3, verse 26, we read, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, having put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If we're in Christ, we're in Abraham's seed, a called according to that promise. And that's a great declaration for us that we have been grafted in, grafted into this place, that we need to get a vision. We need to get a vision to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, to see what is God wanting to speak to us? What is God wanting to share with us? What is he wanting to bring anew and afresh? We need to get our place, selves to that place where we allow a truth and revelation to enter into our spirit. A truth and revelation. Have we looked at it and said, Lord, how much of myself, how much of my flesh, how much of my tradition, how much of my culture, how much of me is stopping you, Lord, from moving in my life? How much of me? Now, Jesus said, you will do more things than he did. And if we to ponder that statement and we think about that, are we actually living that right now? Are we seeing ourselves doing more things than Jesus did? Are we seeing us doing more things that he was released in his ministry to do here? And we have been given that promise that we can do more things than what Christ did. I think a key for that 
is recognizing what was happening to Peter here. Recognizing that we cannot allow culture, we cannot allow tradition, we cannot allow things that we think this is the way, this is the only way to stop the Holy Spirit from talking to us, to stop the Lord from sharing with us and revealing new things. I, I want to know more of God. I want to know more of who he is. I want to bathe in all that he has, not just a portion of that. And so the Holy Spirit, when that becomes your prayer, the Holy Spirit will set your course on a way that allows him to speak to you and allows the words to come into your spirit so it brings forth life. And it's not just words that have been spoken. Paul, uh, Peter had this revelation of God. And of course, next week we're going to talk about the third aspect. And that's the Father, Son and Holy Spirit that's in this story. And we're going to talk about that. And uh, But Peter has this encounter. He goes to Cornelius' place and he starts to preach the gospel. And of course, it says we know that the Holy Spirit fell. But Peter made a statement and he worked and stood upon that statement and he went out and preached. And from when he preached, it started to open the door. We see that 10 years after this event is where Paul starts to go out on his missionary trips. Ten years from when Jesus says, go into the world to preach the gospel. Ten years it takes for Peter had this revelation where he moves forward and says, yes, God is the God of the Gentiles as well. And it was ten years from there after Peter had done a work through that area of Joppa, through that area of Caesarea, where Peter is then able to, Paul is then able to go out and share into the other nations and opens up this amazing door. I want us to go back to 2 Corinthians 4. And I want us to read that again. We are like common jars of clay that carry this glorious treasure within. If you know Jesus, you carry this glorious, amazing treasure. Not just something that's nice. That it's life into our bones it's life into our soul so that the extraordinary overflow of the power of god what a description there the extraordinary overflow not just poured out but it's saying the abundance the overflow of god's power will be seen in our lives not our power not what we have but the overflow of god's power and though we experience every kind of pressure we're not crushed. You are not crushed today. At times, we don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. Well, what's the option that we have? Lord, I can't do this anymore. I I've just had enough. You know, maybe we feel a bit like that at times. But we need to remember quitting is not an option. Because in Christ, he is our hope. He is our strength. That while we may at times be downcast, he is the one that, that stirs us within and places that fire within our spirit that we can press on. We are persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but we're not out. We continually share in the death of Jesus in our bodies so that the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. We consider living to mean that we are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. And that's an important key. If we're not prepared, if I am not prepared to put to death the things in my life, how will I see the glory of Christ revealed in me? And if I want to see more of Christ, I have to put to death my thoughts. I have to put to death my convictions. I have to put to death my desires. I have to put to death my perceptions. I have to put to death my traditions. I have to put to death my culture. I have to put to death all the things that would hinder me from moving forward in this race. Moving forward so that I could see the glory of Christ revealed in my life. So then, death, death is at work in us. But... It releases life in you. So we see there in verse 12, death is at work, 
but it brings forth life. There's the key as well. Verse 13, we have the same spirit of faith that is described in the scriptures when it says, first I believed, then I spoke in faith. So, is the oil in a lamp the kind of oil that God needs to place us, to suspend our natural senses? Are we putting an oil in our life that we're prepared to suspend our natural senses, suspend all these things so that our focus can be constantly to see what God would have for us? Church, I believe that God has amazing, amazing things for you all. That there is promise, there is hope. That there is more to life than what we're seeing right now. That at this time in our season, that we could see the goodness of God revealed in your life, in my life, so that we can proclaim and share the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of salvation that for anyone that believes, for anyone that believes. And perhaps today that you may not know Jesus if you're watching this online. You may not know Jesus. You may not have a revelation of who Jesus is. And perhaps those even who have had an encounter with Jesus, maybe you've walked away. Maybe it's not as alive inside you. Do you know about Jesus? Or do you actually know Jesus? Do you know who Jesus is from reading the word? from Sunday school classes, from church visits? Or do you have a relationship with Jesus that is alive and fruitful and well? Do you have a relationship that you fall in love with him over and over again? Or is Jesus just in a book that you place on the shelf and just remove when you need it? Jesus wants to be more than that. He desires that we would walk in oneness with the Father that we would have this relationship with him that is so unique and so alive. And you can have that too today. And if that's you today, then I want to ask you, turn to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of my faith. He's the delight of my life. He is my love, my joy, my everlasting. He is the one that encourages me. He's the one that lifts me up. And if everything I do in this earth would stop, my life with Jesus would have to remain, and that's enough. If everything in this earth would stop, Jesus is enough for me. Is Jesus enough for you? Is Jesus enough for you? Can we take this time right now to just ponder those thoughts? And if you'd like to contact us, you can go to our website, you can connect with us, you can call with us. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to just be able to connect with you and share Jesus with you. And for those that know him, this is the day the Lord's made. And we'll rejoice in it and we'll be glad. This is the day that God has made for you. This is the day that God has made for you. That you're able to move forward and declare Jesus is Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we just pray right now? Father, I thank you this morning for your presence. I thank you for who you are. And I thank you for your joy everlasting. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your death and resurrection upon the cross. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your blood atoned for all my sin, past, present, and future. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are poured out into my life. And we welcome you into our hearts, into our homes, into our lives, Holy Spirit. That we would give you free reign to show us the areas where we need to cut away. To show us the areas where we need to shift. To show us what culture and traditions we would need to stop. So that the glory of you, Jesus Christ, would be revealed. And I pray that right now over everyone. I pray for the glory of Jesus Christ to be revealed in your life. I pray for the goodness of God to be revealed in your life. That you would experience the amazing presence and touch of the Holy Spirit, that you would experience this amazing relationship with Jesus. And Lord, I pray for that. I pray for everyone throughout this season, Lord. I pray for everyone in isolation. And Lord, I pray for your comfort. 
I pray for your presence. And for those who may be sick today, I pray for your healing touch. And I believe, Lord, in your supernatural healing. By your stripes, we are healed. And so I just declare that this morning, your promises and just your glory and your goodness upon us all. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Be blessed. Have a great rest of the week. And we'll see you on Tuesday and Thursday.